So in today's lesson, we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday when we began our discussion around the gas laws. So you'll remember that we introduced to you the idea of pressure as a measure of the rate at which particles are colliding with the sides of their container. We also might want to think about that as force per unit area, right? So really what we're talking about is if I had a container and, um, you know, I had little particles in here, we're talking about that pressure gets created by the force of the particles hitting the sides of that container. So we also discussed some common units used in chemistry, um, such as the kilopascal and um, the atmosphere. Those are the most common. And we also talked about some handy conversion factors that you need to know um, because not all questions will give pressure in the appropriate unit. So when we left off yesterday, I'd assigned you some practice in converting units, and I'm hoping that you were able to do that successfully. But what we didn't get to that I'd hoped we would were a couple of other important definitions. So just as a thermometer measures temperature, a barometer, anything with meter in it is going to, have, is going to measure something, a barometer is, is the name of the instrument that we use to measure pressure, measure air pressure. So, for instance, if you're looking on the weather network um, and you might be looking up the weather, the temperature for the day, you may also see that they may have measured the barometric pressure, which will usually be given in kilopascals. Um, you know, on the radio, they may talk about the barometric pressure on a given day being a certain value, right? Um, and so that gives you an indication about what the uh, weather might be li like. For example, a low barometric pressure, a low barometric pressure means that you have a higher chance of precipitation, uh, whereas a higher barometric pressure or a rising barometric pressure indicates that the weather might be improving, it might be less cloudy and more sunny out. Uh, okay, so now I talked about temperature really briefly, but you know, if we're looking at what temperature means from a chemistry point of view, one way to think about it is to consider that in um, you know, a sample of matter, um, you're going to have a bunch of different particles um, that are moving about, right? Um, so matter is in constant motion. And so if we were to measure the average energy of movement, the average kinetic energy of the molecules or particles in a substance, uh, then that is what we call temperature. That is what temperature measures, is how quickly the particles are moving in a particular sample of matter. So for example, if we increase the temperature, we're giving the particles of that sample more energy, which will allow them to move more quickly. Right? We know that generally speaking, the particles of a gas have higher energy, so why they can overcome the forces of attraction between the part of the uh, particles of that substance, right? Whereas in a solid, the particles have less energy, and so they're closer together. Those attractive force, intermolecular forces, are going to keep them closer together um, as a result. So another important topic to discuss is the unit that we want to use in chemistry most often, uh, which is units of Kelvin. So the unit Kelvin is a measurement uh, of temperature that is sort of analogous to Celsius um, in that every degree Celsius that you will in, go up by, Kelvins will also go up by the same amount. So for example, um, if we look at the temperature at which water will freeze, zero degrees Celsius, the equivalent Kelvin value is 273 Kelvin. So in other words, zero degrees Celsius equals 273 Kelvin. So there's a nice handy conversion factor which we will look at. Now we also know that if we look at when water boils, okay, so I'm jumping up by 100 degrees Celsius here, 100 degrees Celsius, the equivalent Kelvin value is 373 Kelvin. So notice that you know, while we saw a jump of 100 degrees between 0 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius, we see the same change in Kelvin. Okay? Now that helps us um, to convert from Kelvin to Celsius. So you know, just think of, of Kelvin as just another unit that we can use in chemistry to represent temperature. Now, one thing that we should know, that I want you to note, is that there are no negatives on the Kelvin scale. The lowest value Kelvin is zero Kelvin, 
um, which is equivalent to 207, minus 273 degrees Celsius. And that has a very specific name. It's called absolute zero. And we're going to talk about that in a second, right? So absolute zero means zero Kelvin. That's what that means. Um, but if you want to convert um, from degrees Celsius into Kelvin, you're, all you're going to do is you're going to simply add 273 to your degrees Celsius value. If you want to convert from Kelvin to degrees Celsius, well, you're going to do the opposite. You're going to subtract 273 Kelvin from the Kelvin value to give you Celsius. So, for example, um, if I had, if I wanted to get, and let me just kind of get rid of some stuff here so that we can, I'm going to erase a bunch. So let me erase some of this. So, for example, if I had... I'm going to, let me get my pen here. If I had 20 degrees Celsius, I can get the equivalent Kelvin temperature by simply adding 273 to that, right? So 273 plus 20, right, will give me 293 Kelvin. And so there I've converted Okay, now the Kelvin uh, scale is really good because like we said, there are no negatives in it, which makes some of our formulas work a little bit better. So let's say for instance, I would like for you to try this next problem, which is that I would like for you to um, calculate the equivalent Kelvin temperature if I were to give you a temperature, let's say outside today, let's say it was negative uh, 15 degrees Celsius, right? What would that be, the, what would the equivalent value be in um, Kelvin, okay? So go ahead and calculate this, pause the video, and then come back with your answer. Okay, so I'm hoping what you did was you simply added 273 to that value, and when you do that, you should end up with, well, 273, 263, 258 Kelvin. And notice that it is not degrees Kelvin, but simply Kelvin. Okay, so um, I've already talked about absolute zero as a concept, but now I'd like to discuss it a little bit more. Okay, so we already know that the uh, that zero Kelvin is equivalent to negative 273 degrees Celsius, right? And so this is sort of a hypothetical value here. Um, and how they got that, um, scientists do what we call, they will take data, they will collect data, and they will extrapolate that data. Uh, you may remember that in, I want to say it was grade 9 or grade 10 science, we did a little experiment where we measured our foot length versus our, um, or our height versus our arm span, or our foot length versus our forearm length and we extrapolated the data. So, you know, for instance, we could say, well, and we got a bunch of data, right, and we saw that there happened to be a linear relationship there. And so, for instance, we could figure out, you know, on average, if we had somebody with, let's say, a size 8 shoe, right, we might be able to say, well, okay, their forearm length is probably of a certain value, which we don't really know what it is, right? But then we might say, well, we, we don't have anybody down the line here who maybe has a size 14 foot, but what would their forearm length look like? And so we would extrapolate, we would extend this line of best fit and go and figure out what the equivalent forearm length is. And so that's sort of what scientists did when in trying to um, figure out what absolute zero would be, right? And so um, what they did was they would plot the volume of a certain sample against the temperature. And they said, well, you know, and if it's a gas, we know that as the temperature increases, right, if I have a gas, I know that as, you know, think about um, a balloon, right, or as temperature increases, we know that the pressure uh, is going to increase, and if you have an expandable um, container, then you should see the volume of the gas increase as it spreads apart, right? So this is what they did. So they, they plotted t temperature against volume, and they saw that 
as the temperature went up, the volume increased accordingly, right? And, and that should make sense. But then they thought, well, you know, what happens if I decrease the temperature? They weren't able to measure all the way back, but if I decrease the temperature, kept decreasing it, what would the temperature be when the volume of gas was zero? In other words, when there was th those atoms or molecules occupied zero volume. And of course, this is all hypothetical because you really can't um, do that. That's really hard. Then matter ceases to exist, right? So if you have zero volume, then those atoms are going to occupy no space. So what they saw was that the exact point, that x-intercept right here, that x-intercept happened exactly at, um, you know, they predicted it would be at negative 273 Kelvin, uh, degrees Celsius, rather, which is equal to zero Kelvin, right? So that is a theoretical um, concept, but scientists continue to work to try and achieve absolute zero. I have a couple of videos that I'm going to post on Google Classroom for you to watch. Um, so that you can <clears throat> get uh, a bit of a deeper understanding of absolute zero, um, and it will um, hopefully strengthen your understanding of this concept. But if you have any questions, please feel free to hold off, and, and we can talk about them in class. So um, I want to introduce you to a couple of other um, important acronyms that you need to be aware of, um, and they are STP and SATP. So if you can imagine that you are a scientist working in the world of science, it helps to have certain, um, certain um, measurements sort of uh, standardized, if you, will, if you will. So that, for instance, if you're working in Canada and you're doing experiments, and there may be somebody else um, in Europe somewhere doing experiments, that you all sort of do the experiments under a typical set of conditions so that you can kind of compare your results and then that those results are meaningful, right? So um, one set of conditions under which experiments are often performed or can be performed is under STP or standard conditions of so standard temperature and pressure because that's what the T and the P stand for. So standard temperature is considered to be zero degrees Celsius. And of course, we add 273 to that and that's gives us our equivalent Kelvin measurement for temperature. And standard pressure is considered to be 101.3 kilopascals, okay? So in some future problems that we will be solving, they may tell you that the gas is being worked on at STP, in which case what they're really telling you is they're giving you what the temperature is and of that gas, and they're telling you the pressure of that gas in that question. Okay, now, um, as you can imagine, zero degrees Celsius is not a super convenient way <laughs> to run experiments. So um, often experiments may be run under SATP conditions, which stands for standard ambient temperature and pressure, right? So ambient lighting means sort of like a comfortable lighting. So standard ambient temperature and pressure describes sort of average conditions. Okay, so what are those? Well. SATP conditions um, are where the temperature is 225 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin, and the pressure is 100 kilopascals, and we're going to assume three sig significant digits for that. Okay, so again, a question will either give you, they may give you the actual temperature and pressure measurements, or they may say that the experiment was condu conducted under STP conditions or SATP conditions, in which case you will know or have to remember the uh, associated temperature and pressure values.